Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to let everyone come in here. I can see the numbers going up. Just feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to hear what your role is in long term care and where you work or unmute yourself and say hello. 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 Welcome. Hi. <laughs> I, um, I'm Joanna, I'm an LPN and I'm a residential manager or manager of residential care and supervisor of an assisted living facility. Which and assisted living facility? Which long-term care site? Victoria. Yeah, nice. Um, I totally had a crazy day and I literally just got home. So I'm going to be listening to you guys and feeding my six-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Welcome everyone. Feel free to let us know which site you work at, what your role is in long-term care. You can pop it in the chat there if you like. Glad Jamie? you could be here. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm uh, an RN at Cairnsmore Place. Uh, I'm new to Island Health. So I took the Vancouver Coastal Health Wound Care course and um, which was a two day long course. So I'm interested to see what this one's like. Great, welcome. I've been in long-term care for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well. Welcome everyone. We can see our numbers are slowly going up there. We'll just give it another minute or two while people join. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're calling in from or zooming in from, I guess is the correct terminology now. Which long-term care site you work at, what your role is. I see Dr. Brooke is here again. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you. You'll be pleased. I was, I was hoping you'd be here this evening. Erin is joining us to talk about palliative wounds. And I know we, we spent a lot of time talking about that last time. So mm -hmm. it's going to be great for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, we'll just give it another minute here while people come on. See lots of people introducing themselves in the chat. Thanks. Good to see you. Well, I guess I can't see you. Good to read you. Okay, so I guess we'll get started. Please feel free to continue to introduce yourself there in the chat. Let us know what site you work at, what your role is, what you do in long-term care. Um, so I'm Jessica, the operations lead for the Long-Term Care Initiative. I'd like to take a moment to welcome you this evening. Um, it is with great respect and appreciation that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the Souk Nation, where I feel very lucky to work and live. Um, so I'd like to just quickly run through a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please keep yourself muted as background noise can amplify very quickly. There are CME credits available for this event. A member of the LTCI team will email you a certificate in the next couple of days. Um, at the end of the evening, there will be an evaluation. Please take a moment uh, to fill this in. Your feedback is really important to us. Uh, this event will be recorded and posted on our website along with a copy of the slides from this evening. Um, if you have questions throughout the evening, please save them for the Q&A portion at the end, or you can feel free to pop them in. There's a Q&A box. If you look down on the bottom of your Zoom screen, it should be on the right-hand side. There is a specified Q&A box, so feel free to use that to answer, uh, put some questions in. Um, there will be plenty of time left at the end for discussion, so we'll have a really robust conversation at the end. Um, so please, again, if you haven't introduced yourself already, please feel free to do so and let us know what your role is in long-term care. Finally, I'd like to introduce our presenters for the evening, Shelley Barnes and Erin Ballard. Erin grew up on Vancouver Island and has been nursing since 2009. She began her career as an LPN at an, uh, in acute care, working with post-operative patients. She completed her degree in nursing in 2018 and continued to work in acute care in the areas of oncology and palliative care. Her interest and experience in wound care led her to complete a nursing specialty in 2021, and she is now a nurse specialized in wounds, ostomy, and continence. She moved from acute care to long-term care earlier this year and is now an NSWOC for 60 long-term care facilities throughout the island health. 
Shelley has been with Island Health for many years, working in the burn unit and Royal Tube before the PCC. She worked caring for surgical plastics, wounds, ENT, and urology patients. She has worked in community ambulatory clinics, home care, the burn outpatient clinic, and recently joined the long-term care team as an educator. Shelley's passion is wound care. She is a CNA accredited NSWOC and an academic advisor for the SWAN program. Shelley's name is on the latest Canadian urology diversions position uh, statement publication and she has been asked to contribute to a skin and wounds textbook. Shelley loves to talk wounds and when she isn't she's enjoying early Baroque music and will be traveling back to India as soon as she can. She also has a thing for penguins. So on that note, please welcome our presenters and over to you. Guilty, thank you so much for the introductions and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Put that off there. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, NSWAP stands for Nurse Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Care, and they're certified through advanced education. And although tonight we're talking about wounds, NSWAPs can also help with fecal and urinary incontinence and products, including catheters, as well as ostomy supplies and postdoc teaching. We will provide that referral form for accessing the long-term care NSWAP with Erin at the end of our presentation. Next slide. I don't have any uh, conflict of interest to declare tonight, and my current busyness is up on the screen. There will be an opportunity at the end for, um, for you to help us improve for the next presentation with the survey. So please help us better appreciate what will go well tonight, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see changed for next time. Um, do sign in to the chat with your role and where you work. And again, the session is being recorded and the slides will be available. So don't worry about taking notes, take in the content. Our goal tonight is to provide best practice, evidence-informed education for some common wound etiologies in long-term care. And we hope to achieve that by reviewing some basics of skin anatomy and physiology, which forms the basis of all wound assessment. So we'll examine skin tears, palliative wounds, and lower leg dermatitis tonight, and practice application of our learning through some case studies. We'll also provide the most up-to-date resources available on the island, and then we'll open up a conversation for questions and sharing the expertise that's here this evening. And if you only take one thing home tonight, <laughs> it, make sure that you're saving the Click website. Um, that's Shelly, sorry to interrupt, but I've, I've lost you in, all I can see is your background. So you've disappeared into the background. Oh, I will try to fix that. <laughs> I'm going to continue on though. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but we, we just can't see you. We can only see Victoria. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fine too. <laughs> okay. So um, let's move on. A, a quick review about how wounds heal. So the first uh, phase is hemostasis and immediately after a partial or full thickness injury the smaller vessels constrict and platelets will trigger the clotting cascade when they collect in damaged vessels. Platelets also release cytokines and growth factors that are needed for healing and help to create that fibrin scaffolding for cell migration. Then we have inflammation so that includes vasoconstriction followed by vasodilation and increased permeability of the capillaries to allow the plasma and those leukocytes to leak into the wound bed. And this will happen within minutes and last for the first uh, one to four days. Um, and that explains the pain, the heat, the edema, that erythema, and all that exudate of the inflammatory phase. That's expected and it's not an infectious process. It's the body working hard to clean up the construction site as it were. Next is proliferation or regeneration, and that's the filling in stage. So extracellular matrix and proteins are laid down to create some new, gen some new uh, granulation tissue. There's some provisional type three collagen in the new tissue, and that's not very strong. Angiogenesis in the proliferation phase creates that bright red color seen in new scar tissue. And there's also some wound contraction to help close the wound edges. And healable wounds should close in about three weeks. The final phase is the remodeling or the maturation phase. So that type three collagen from the proliferation stage now gets replaced by a stronger type one. So at about two to three months after injury, there's around 60% tensile strength in this tissue. 
And even when the wound is fully healed in about two years, there's only 80%, which means there's a risk of future breakdown in that area of injury. Tissues aren't going to get back to 100% strength because the normal dermis and subcutaneous and deeper tissues, they've been replaced with scar tissue. Next slide. So the goal of care is the initial decision we need to make in wound care. Is the wound healable or is it a maintenance wound or a palliative wound? We need to know this before we start planning. And we're going to consider the whole patient, not the whole in the patient. And we do know that there are many factors that it can interfere with wound healing. Our, our elderly population are less able to initiate a good inflammatory response. And so they're at risk for infection and delayed wound healing. And if our, if our clients aren't willing or able to participate in the plan of care, or if there's infection or lifestyle choices, say around smoking, that will impact wound healing too. So you might need a referral to the dietitian if you're, let's say your Braden nutrition subscale is two or less, or you know, you're concerned your client isn't taking enough fluids or nutrition. Pain scales will help us monitor pain effectiveness of analgesia and you know, any developing infection. Um, medications like steroids, anticoagulants, chemo can interfere with some of the phases of the wound healing. And then of course, pressure and shearing forces also interfere as will chronic disease that results in poor perfusion and, and vascular compromise. So there's many factors that can delay wound healing. Um, inappropriate wound care and wound products that are maximizing a moist wound healing environment bacterial balance is another consideration, and biofilm. Biofilm can form in a wound within hours, and that biofilm maintains a state of inflammation in chronic wounds, and it blocks topical treatments. Um, so does uh, edema in lower legs and poorly managed exudate. So all of this is why we need a really good holistic assessment of the client and their wound when we're planning wound care. Determining if a wound is healable, maintenance or not healable guides our wound care plan, as well as things like etiology, the age of the wound and, and where the wound is located. It takes, oh, I don't know, 30, 45 minutes to do a thorough and initial assessment of a client and their wound, considering all of the information we need to determine healability and then a plan of care. So going forward, weekly assessments with measurements and photos, getting the dressings down, cleaning the wound, applying products. That can take anywhere from another, you know, 15 minutes to 30, depending on the situation. So don't expect that you'll be able to assess wound healability and provide good wound care in just a few minutes. It takes time and attention to do it well. So once we've developed a good care plan, can we, sorry, can we just stay on this slide for a sec? We need to monitor progress and watch for infection. So we just talked about infection as a barrier to wound healing. And it's worth a few minutes here to just look at how to determine if a wound is infected or not. And all chronic wounds are colonized simply because they've been open for so long. But once that wound becomes critically colonized, the wound gets stuck in that inflammatory phase of healing and it can't move forward to close. So we need to intervene here with topical antimicrobials to manage bacterial burden as these wounds can quickly progress to a, a deeper tissue infection. Um, you know, it's not best practice to use topical antimicrobials to prevent infection. That contributes to antibiotic resistance and in edema especially, um, it's cytotoxic and uh, rarely indicated on an ongoing basis. In some specific cases, it might be appropriate, but rule of thumb is to monitor and assess regularly and, and manage your bacteria and your moisture. And then if the wound does start to show signs of critical colonization or infection, that's the time to start having a conversation about those topical antimicrobials. A localized infection presents with, you know, very little change in the size of the wound, so it's not closing. Um, less than 30% healing in about three weeks would be a good indicator there. New um, pain, change in odor, there may be some new purulent drainage. You know, you've got about two centimeters of redness and warmth around the peri area, peri wound area. A critically colonized wound base um, often is, it's got that hypergranulation tissue. It's bright red, bleeds easily. It has that really bumpy surface that sits up above the level of the skin. 
And you can also look for little islands of epithelial bridging or pockets. And those look like little, little areas of pale pink against the bright red wound base. But if you're noticing deterioration of the wound, it's getting bigger, there's new open areas, the drainage, the pain, the heat are all increasing, and you know the erythema is now beyond that two centimeter measurement. Um, if you have more than two of those signs of infection, it warrants a call to your prescribing practitioner. They're going to want a CMS. Infection is a clinical decision based on the signs and symptoms, but treatment is determined by a wound culture. And just a little note here, immunocompromised and diabetic clients only need to have one of those signs of infection. And especially if it's new, changed, or increase in pain, call your MRP. Those, those residents have a muted presentation of infection. So when you do start to see changes, we need to respond right away. And if the wound probes to bone or there's wet gangrene, that, that wet ash guard, or systemic infection with your diabetic clients, or um, with those arterial wounds, MRP needs to assess immediately. Those are potentially life or limb threatening situations. So let's, um, let's do a little practice. Can we advance the slide? Have a look at the four wounds and um, think about what we've, what we've just discussed and try to decide what you think is happening here. Are the wounds infected, colonized, critically colonized or contaminated? I think we've got a little quiz to try. It's confidential folks, don't worry about it. Just, you know, see if you can pick out which one is which. Moving on. I'll give you the answer when we're all finished. How about the next one? Answers there. Let's move that one forward. Good. Third one. <laughs> and how about the last one? Aaron's looking at the answers over here. <laughs> Great. Okay. So here, here are the answers for those of you that were keeping track. So that first one, the upper left, is contaminated. That's not a healthy looking wound base. And then the one beside it, the upper right, is critically colonized. There's that, that really red color to the tissues, and it's going to bleed really easily. The bottom left is infected. And I think you can see the slough and the purulent drainage in that one. And then the bottom right is colonized. That one's colonized. And you can actually see the biofilm on this one. So again, if you think your wound is deteriorating or it's infected, you need to start treatment within 24 hours to manage bacterial burden and pain. And you know, remember, it's easier to treat topically than to treat sepsis. <laughs> yeah, we see you, Dr. Brooke. <laughs> Next slide, please. So I keep mentioning biofilm. So here it is. Biofilm is present in 60 to 90% of those chronic wounds, and often you won't be able to see it. Biofilm is this extracellular polysaccharide matrix of wound debris and bacteria and fungi. It's polymicrobial, and the pathogens create this barrier, this protective cover that prevents topical treatments from getting down to the wound bed where we need them to work. And biofilm will also block cultures for CNS. So again, the, it, it covers the wound bed. So we're not able to get down and get contact with those cells and tissues. So we need to get rid of it. And that means debridement. <laughs> There's lots of ways to debride wounds to manage and prevent biofilm. Um, a referral to our long-term care and swap is your first step. So Aaron will help you assess the wound, 
and then make a decision about the best way to go forward. Just a little quick note here, there's some um, uh, two little links at the bottom. Practical nurses in Island Health are not able to independently create wound care plans or initiate debridement at this time. We're working on that. RNs are required to complete additional education before initiating some forms of debridement. So the links for limits and conditions for our Island Health nurses are there on the screen. Um, but you know, you can connect with either Erin or I, the NSWACs know what the limits are, and we can help you sort out a plan of care. Next slide. Now for the fun part of the evening, <laughs> the case studies. Um, there were requests for these three wound types. So Erin's uh, gonna jump in here and talk about palliative wounds. We're so lucky to have, here, have her here today. She's really, really knowledgeable. Um, and then after Erin's finished, I'll pop back in and we'll do uh, skin tears and stasis dermatitis. So over to you, Erin. Hi everyone. Here you go. Okay. How is that? Difficulties. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, that's much better. Uh, let me just get my slides up here. Um, and hi to everyone. Uh, thanks for coming tonight to listen to Shelly and I. We really appreciate it. Uh, we always like talking about wounds. Um, okay, so let me just start at the beginning here. I'm sorry. That's okay. I think I just have this bar up here. Yeah, can you help? I need to start at the beginning. Sorry, guys. <laughs> There's something in my way here. Shoot. There you go. Just click on the slide. Yeah. Okay, well, to. I have to do it this way, I'm afraid. It's not as big as I wanted it to be, but however, here we go. <laughs> um. So I'm Erin, I'm the new NSWOC for long-term care, as you heard, and I have a particular interest in palliative wounds. I'm happy that I was invited tonight to talk about palliative wounds. Uh, so I have no conflict of interest to declare. And let's just briefly go over our objectives for uh, tonight. So we're just going to discuss a, a, a palliative approach to wound care and what that looks like. Um, we'll identify the three most common palliative wounds that we see. Um, then we're going to look at a case study. And, sorry. <laughs> and then we're going to take a look at the most common uh, palliative wound symptoms and how we manage those. And then we'll return to our case study, take what we've learned and develop a wound care plan for that case study. So a palliative approach to wound care, what does that look like? What does that mean? Um, it's still active care of that wound, but instead of focusing on healing a wound, now we're focusing instead on optimizing quality of life um, and managing symptoms, promoting comfort really. So that could look like very different things depending on each resident, but it often includes, you know, making sure that we're um, doing less frequent wound care if possible. And um, we'll 
be discontinuing any unnecessary assessments like Shelley was talking about. That would be weekly uh, measurements, weekly photos, that sort of thing. So our three most common palliative wounds here are malignant wounds, and those are most often seen um, in breast cancer and head and neck cancer. Um, these are probably, in my experience, they're most challenging symptomatically. Um, arterial wounds as well are seen often, and then uh, pressure injuries. Pressure injuries are probably the most common uh, wound that we see in our palliative population. So let's talk about a case study. Um, I did choose a malignant wound because like I said, I find these the most challenging symptomatically. Um, so Mr. Nguyen is a 75 year old man with a fungating breast tumor. And he and the facility staff are really struggling with um, his wound care. Uh, it's The wound is very odorous. The uh, dressing is, is constantly wet and falling off. Um, there is some occasional bleeding uh, with wound care and um, that bleeding often uh, causes anxiety for him and for his family and for the staff. And he is also having pain whenever the dressing is changed. So what can we do? So let's talk about those symptoms, those common palliative wound symptoms. Uh, the first one is pain. Um, so we have pharmacological and non-pharmacological strategies that we can employ for localized wound pain in the palliative wound. Um, non-pharmacological strategies are really individualized to the resident, but you know some of the things that you could use are distraction techniques like music or television or maybe a fan um, or maybe having a family member present during wound care or a spiritual provider present, anything like that, anything that brings the resident comfort, we're gonna, um, we're gonna include under those non-pharmacological strategies. And then pharmacologically, we have uh, topical options for wound pain. And that, when I talk about topical, is generally morphine. That's our uh, medication of choice uh, topically for wounds. And just remembering that um, it is quite effective, but there are a few things that um, we need to ensure, one of them being that you have an exposed wound bed. So if your wound is completely covered in necrotic tissue, um, then topical morphine won't be effective. But um, if you do have an exposed wound bed there and pain, um, morphine is best delivered in a gel formulation. And, and that's because the viscosity of the gel um, adheres uh, more effectively to the, uh, the receptors in that pain bed and, and um, provides that pain relief more than a liquid, as the liquid just usually kind of slides right off because these wounds are often very wet. And so it doesn't have the time to adhere to the wound bed. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a morphine gel in Island Health, I did check. Um, so the only way to access that is through the compounding pharmacy. And actually, I have a slide at the end about, about topical morphine. Um, so that will provide a bit more information, but um, but we do have, um, uh, yes, the compounding pharmacy, so it can be compounded, or we have the liquid formulation, which in the absence of, of anything else, um, you can certainly try the liquid morphine, and I would suggest um, a more of a soak than a spritz. The spritz is just gonna sort of slide right off immediately, but maybe a five minute soak is better. Um, so topically, that's our, our choice there. And then um, also procedural pain relief is important to consider as well. So if your resident is having pain um, during wound care, uh, ensure that you have a PRN medication um, ordered for procedural pain. And, and the two that I'm talking about here are these short acting medications, uh, sufentanil and fentanyl. Um, and sufentanil would be appropriate for the, the residents that are opioid tolerant, um, fentanyl for those uh, residents that are opioid naive. 
And then other strategies to reduce pain are minimizing adhesives to the peri wound, um, using a, a gentler adhesive when you do have to use it. So the blue silicone tape is, is the best choice there. And then using a skin prep underneath the adhesive to, um, to protect that peri wound skin and uh, using an adhesive remover when you're taking the old dressing off as well. And then dressing selection um, specific to, to pain relief. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is really the non-adherence. We just wanna make sure that that dressing is not gonna stick to the wound bed because that's gonna cause pain when you're taking it off. So any non-adherence there. Okay, our next symptom is odor. Um, and particularly the malignant wounds are, can be very odorous. I'm sure lots of you have had this experience in your practice. Um, so there's some things that we could do to really reduce the odor from these wounds. Um, firstly, we're going to uh, perhaps do some gentle mechanical debridement. If there's any loose necrotic tissue on top of that wound bed, um, the this gentle debridement will sort of get rid of some of that loose debris and this is where our odor is coming from as the bacteria kind of proliferates in uh, that necrotic tissue so if we get rid of some of that um, it should help a little bit with odor um, and then uh, topical metronidazole is, has been used um, effectively for uh, wound odor and, and same as the morphine best delivered in a gel form. And, and this is one that we do actually have on our formulary. So that's a good thing. Um, and uh, so applying a layer of that gel with every dressing change can help with wound odor. Um, dressing selection specific to odor, we're looking at antimicrobials because you know the odor is coming from that bacteria. And um, or charcoal dressings. And, and actually in Island Health, we do have a, um, a combined charcoal silver dressing called Actisorb. So that's a nice one and it's non-adherent. So that's great too. Um, and environmental strategies also we can add in. And I will say like all of these, it's best if you take them uh, together because you know no one thing is really going to eliminate the odor um, from these wounds. So um, adding in some environmental strategies like um, a charcoal air purifier, although that's rather costly, um, although on the more cost effective end I have uh, utilized pans of kitty litter under the bed um, and, or some coffee grounds in the room um, a lot of um, sources talk about aromatherapy being effective. This might be a bit challenging depending on what your scent policy is at your facility, but that is also another strategy there. Um, so excessive exudate is another uh, challenging symptom that we see with palliative wounds. And, and there are several things that could be contributing there. Bacteria is one, when a wound is infected, um, it's going to produce more exudate and uh, as well, the amount of necrotic tissue on a lot of these wounds um, causes more exudate as the, the body's trying to autolytically debride that tissue. Um, and also there could be some end of life edema, edema that is contributing. So again, some gentle debridement um, mechanical debridement of that necrotic tissue, just gently irrigating the wound bed. Um, dressing selection for uh, excessive exudate is, is just focused around those super absorbent dressings, as they're called, um, that are designed to absorb a high amount of exudate. So that's your classic pad or your mesorb. And, um, and then ensuring that we are protecting the peri wound skin from all this exudate is important as well, because um, that exudate is quite damaging to the peri wound skin, and then you're gonna have some denudement of the skin there. So um, you can use skin prep or the um, Remedy HydroGuard silicone cream, that's the blue one. Um, those, are, those are effective for providing that barrier. And then the last um, symptom I wanted to talk about tonight was wound bleeding. 
Uh, again, I would say this is uh, a high risk for those malignant wounds. Um, these wounds are highly vascular as, as the tumor has often eroded the blood vessels in the wound. Um, and there's, there's some immature um, blood vessels as well. So they're just at higher risk of bleeding. There's also, um, you know, end of life platelet um, dysfunction that could be contributing as well to that bleed risk. So uh, the most important first step there is recognizing the risk. So if you have a, a resident with a uh, malignant wound, um, chances are, and, and maybe talk with the um, physician about it, that you could be, it, it could be at risk of uh, bleeding. And then once you've uh, identified that, you can minimize the risk with some moist wound, um, ensuring you have a moist wound bed. And again, like preventing any dressings from sticking. Um, so using those non-adherents. And then I, it's important to make a plan for if that bleeding occurs. And this includes a team meeting. You're gonna get together uh, with the resident, maybe family will be involved as well, um, and all the healthcare team and, and talk about goals of care. What are we gonna do in case of a bleed? What are we gonna do in case of a small bleed? And what are we gonna do in case of a severe bleed? And then ensure that that uh, risk is documented in the care plan. Make sure everyone knows, nurses, OTs, HCAs, everyone who's around should know that there's this risk. And, um, and then there's a few things, depending on, on the plan that you've made, you can prepare a few things um, just so you feel calm and prepared as the uh, sign says there. Um, I have written down here a hemorrhage kit and um, having a hemorrhage kit in the room can provide that comfort. Um, and that really just has a few tools in it. You're gonna have some dark towels in case of bleed that you just put over uh, the bleeding so that it's not as um, visually scary. Um, <laughs> and then also some PPE you'll have in that hemorrhage kit to protect yourself. And you could have um, a calcium alginate dressing such as Caltostat, and that's just for a minor bleed, or maybe um, some gauze, um, some items to uh, make a pressure dressing if that's been identified as something that's going to occur in case of a, a minor bleed. Um, and then in case of a se severe bleed, um, anticipatory medications are important. And midazolam is a medication of choice here for a severe bleed, uh, subcutaneous 10 milligram midazolam. Okay, so now that we've learned a few things, let's make a care plan for Mr. Nguyen. Okay, so uh, first we're gonna give him um, two fentanyl five minutes prior to the wound dressing change. We're gonna have our topical morphine gel or however we got our topical morphine ready. Um, and that's on top of the baseline uh, pain medication that Mr. Nguyen has, you know, around the clock, he'll, he's on some PO opioid, let's say, so he's going to have that already on board. Um, and these are just additions. Uh, then we're going to gently irrigate with an antiseptic cleaner. Um, and I've chosen Vashi here, and I haven't really talked about antiseptic cleaners, but um, Instead of normal saline, uh, an antiseptic cleanser such as VASH, it's non-toxic, it's non-irritating, and it just provides more antimicrobial to, to combat those things that we're talking about, like the odor, the exudate. Um, and then we're gonna apply some skin prep to the peri wound. And the dressing I've chosen for our case study tonight is Aquacel AG. And this is in no, no way the only dressing I could have chosen, but... Uh, it was a random choice. Um, so Aquacel AG is, um, I did choose it for a few reasons though. I chose it A because it is, has silver in it. So it's got our antimicrobial property. And then for the hydrofiber property. So it's a hydrofiber dressing, which just means that it's, it, it does kind of look a little bit like a piece of fabric. Um, and it's meant to absorb um, high amounts of exudate. And it turns to a kind of gel when you, when it, when it, absorb some exudate. Um, so you do have to leave about a centimeter um, outside of the wound bed because it like just shrinks a little bit when you um, when it absorbs exudate. Um, so that's why I've chosen that dressing there and it's also a non-adherent. 
And then on top of our primary dressing, which is the dressing that goes directly against the loom bed, I'm going to apply our secondary dressing, which is our absorbent classic pads. And I'm just gonna take those loosely in place with a little bit of that blue silicone tape. And then over top um, to hold everything in place, um, I am going to make a mesh panty tank top. Uh, which is kind of a, a little bit of a creation, but it's worked quite well for me in the past um, because that little bit of silicone tape is just not going to hold that dressing for as long as we want to. And he's going to have clothes on top and, you know, so it is just a pair of mesh panties. You, you cut out the gusset and I, I brought one actually that I made up, so I'll show it later, but you cut out the gusset and um, you put it over Mr. Newen's head with the elastic on the bottom and then a couple of uh, straps are made out of burn net and that's to prevent the whole thing from sliding down so that will kind of hold everything in place and in that way we can leave that aquasol in place for seven days um, and not do a dressing change um, for seven days but depending on the amount of exudate we can take out those classic pads throw them away put some new ones in and we won't be disturbing the loom bed we don't have to do a full you know, wound care, we'll just um, replace those beer in. And then we have our hemorrhage kit ready to go in the room. And I just wanted to share a couple helpful resources with you. I found this lovely app that you can put on your phone and it's called Palliative Wound Pro. Uh, it's got some great resources. I know you can't really see what it says on there, sorry, but um, it's got case studies. It's got dressing suggestions for the case studies. It's got pictures. It's great. Then the Click website that Shelly was talking about. And I've also included the BC Center for Palliative Care Symptom Management Guidelines. And that is specific to the hemorrhage risk that I was talking about. It's got a whole document on that. So um, if you wanted more information about that. Um, I've included this recipe for topical morphine. I won't go through that, but like um, Jessica said, we're recording and, and you can have this available um, to you if you want to know more. And thank you. I um, have included a link also to my referral form. So just um, uh, you can look that up on the internet and uh, that's the link there. Okay, well, thank you. Are we back? <laughs> hey there. Oh, thank you, Erin. I always learn so much when I hear her talk about her wounds. <laughs> Am I back? Can everybody hear me again? Yep, I'm hoping so. Okay. Uh, so, can we advance the slide? Excellent. So uh, I'm gonna start talking about stasis dermatitis. So this is a classic example. This is the dermatitis that we see in venous leg ulcers and it's related to the histamine response to exudate and poor moisture control. And I'm not gonna go deep into venous disease tonight, but think of veins like the highways for garbage trucks. They carry waste products to the lymphatics. And if they can't take away the waste product, it's gonna build up and then it's gonna leak out. So this isn't infection, this is an inflammatory response. And you know, if you start antibiotics that might improve things, but only because of the anti-inflammatory properties of the antibiotics and not because it's infected. So once the antibiotics are finished, the dermatitis is gonna flare up again because you know, we just don't have the exudate under control. The skin needs compression. <laughs> the, the erythema, the scaling, the pruritus are all hallmark signs of stasis dermatitis versus, um, you know, pain that you've seen infection. And you'll need to make sure um, that you have an ABI or toe pressure before you start compressing. OTs and, and NSWOCs can do ABIs during their wound assessment. Um, if you don't have a qualified wound clinician, you might have to send your folks to imaging for Doppler studies. But that's a burden to our, our already stretched healthcare system, and, and you could be waiting for a while. Um, and you know, it's a big deal for our residents too to get to that appointment and then wait for their exam time. But if you don't have access to an NSWAP or an OT, I guess, I guess you're limited there. You do need your ABIs. 
So we also need something for that itchy raw skin, don't we? Um, you could use some visco paste. Uh, the zinc is soothing on the skin and it can stay on for, you know, three or four days. But if you decide to go with topical steroids, those need to be applied daily. And if you're using these, please stop them after about three weeks um, with a maximum dosing of about 50 grams per week. And also remember that steroids will mask an infective process and they can drive a fungal infection deeper. So just make sure that you've ruled out infection first. So we need compression to stop the leak of fluids that are causing the histamine response here in a topical treatment for the dermatitis. So let's advance the screen. The gold standard for compression is at least 30 millimoles of mercury. So compression needs to be elastic, long stretch for clients who are not mobile and not engaging that calf muscle. So those sed sedentary residents who are in bed or they're in a wheelchair all day or they're in recliners, long stretch provides higher resting pressures for resting calf muscles. And we have Pro4 and SurePress on formulary for these folks. These wraps can stay on for up to seven days and the SurePress is reusable. Inelastic or short stretch provides higher working pressure for working calf muscles. So for clients who are mobilizing well, you might consider the Comperlan or the Coban 2, which can also stay on for seven days. And the Comperlan can actually be reused up to about 10 times if it's, if it's still clean. Um, but these wraps don't provide any resting pressure for non-ambulatory residents. So we need to measure circumferentially initially each week uh, to know when we have the edema down far enough to get these folks into stockings that need to be worn forever, every day. Otherwise the ulcers are gonna recur and then they're gonna start weeping again. Um, venous ulcers have a recurrence rate of up to about 70%. So this is one of those conversations to have with your resident and you know, goals of care. Um, are they willing to wear compression? And if not, we're not gonna get this under control and we're gonna to have to shift uh, the dressings that we choose for them. Edema wear is on formulary as well, provides 10 to 20 millimoles of mercury for uh, pressure for residents who you want to start a bit more slowly with, like, you know, for CHF. Um, I will caution folks here that layering of multiple products is off label use. And you might put your license in our organizing, organization at risk if you do that. So edema wear, for example, is to be worn against the skin. And if the resident doesn't tolerate that, it's probably not the best choice for compression. So get a referral to Erin or NSWOC and she'll help you figure out what kind of compression might be better. Um, and as I said, the residents with CHF and COPD, they're not excluded from compression. We just need to be more careful and go a little more slowly. And again, a little note of caution, in Island Health, nurses who apply compression must have additional education and training. So we'll advance the slide. So here we are back to our, there we are. <laughs> so back to our case study. This gentleman has multiple small open areas above the ankle. The borders are irregular. There's lots of drainage that soaks through his socks. There's an odor and he reports that the skin is really itchy. So what can we do? Well, best practice for any wound below the knee is to do a lower limb assessment after we have determined our goals of care. And then we need to determine how much pressure is safe to apply. And you can't tell that by feeling for pulses. That's not best practice to confirm adequate perfusion. You need ABIs. And, you know, we can see he's perfused. The skin's pink and it's warm to touch. We need the ABIs. And we need to do something about that red bra skin too, don't we? Let's go to the next one. So care plan, after, we, after we've done our ABIs and we know, you know what, we've, what we're working with there, let's clean away the drainage that's probably crusted onto the skin. And you can use soap and water or the no rinse foam cleanser, that's fine. Remember, it's not an infection, so we don't need any really special cleansers. Um, so we have some kind of topical treatment for the dermatitis, and we've got some compression to stop the leak of fluids that are causing the histamine response. Um, 
just a little note, when you put somebody into compression, the exudate is going to increase at first. So the dressings are going to be pretty wet for the first few days. And as Erin was talking about, classic pads are really helpful um, to absorb that extra moisture. So, you know, Erin was talking about not wanting things to stick to skin and causing more damage. So if you're going to use classic pads, put those over top of the zinc. Uh, or consider a non-adherent like, like the adaptic so that the absorbent pads don't sit right on the skin. You should only need those topicals for about a week or so until the, uh, the edema and the exudate settle, and then a few applications of the compression. And then once you've got the edema under control, let's get them into stockings. And once these folks are into their stockings and wear them, <laughs> regular skin care, daily moisturizing should maintain that skin. Um, and, you know, elevating the feet higher than the heart for a couple of hours a day is helpful too, if, if you can. If the wounds aren't healing with that compression, you may not have the correct amount of compression or the best product for your resident. Um, and consider a biopsy or swabbing for infection. Long-standing ulcers can convert to malignancies. So it's really important to get adequate compression on right away and keep it on. And finally, let's go to skin tears. Let's advance the slide. There we are. This is a busy slide. <laughs> if you have a skin tear, nurses, you need to report it through PSLS. So we've got three types of skin tears. And when you refer to Erin about skin tears, there's a, there's a spot she's gonna ask about what type because we need to know it guides our dressing selection. So you can see them down the left-hand side. We need to know the type of skin tear. Um, there's a really nice algorithm there in the middle and we're gonna have a look at those interventions a little more closely in, a, in another case study. So generally a skin tear needs a thorough cleansing. These often happen from you know, banging against a, a wheelchair or bed frames. So a full 100 cc's of saline is appropriate to irrigate that area. Uh, you may need to apply some gentle pressure if the wound's still bleeding. Reposition the skin flap if you can. Little moist Q-tip works. Gently roll it, roll that skin back into place. And if the skin flap isn't viable, it may need to be debrided. A type one skin tear can have steri strips. As long as the blood can get out from underneath, um, steri strips are okay and leave them on until they fall off on their own. A type two needs a non-adherent interface. As you can see, there's more, more tissue exposed, so it needs a little non-adherent there. Type three skin tears have a lot of exposed tissue, so these need that non-adherent interface and um, something to manage the exudate. Please don't put occlusive products like hydrocolloids on skin tears or telfa because it sticks to that exposed tissue. Go with a, a silicone contact layer that can stay in place and then a more absorbent dressing on top. That's going to work if you're expecting a, a fair amount of drainage. If you know it's on a lower limb that's got a lot of edema or there's a larger area of exposed tissue in the, in the skin tear. We don't want to disturb the healing. So choose a dressing that you can stay put for as long as possible. And I love Tegaderm absorbance for this. They're, they've got the little gel pad in the middle and it will absorb moisture to maintain that nice moist wound healing environment. The gel cushion is protective, it's nice and cool, plus you can see through it. So you don't have to keep taking the dressing off to assess. But if you need more absorbency than that, a foam dressing like the Methylex works well. And if you've got one with a silicone border, you can lift up the edge and, and have a peek underneath. For the physicians and nurse practitioners who are here this evening, please do not suture or staple skin tears. Some of the worst wound infections and further trauma that I've seen personally have been skin tears that were sutured. The blood pools and coagulates, under, coagulates underneath that flap and then it exerts pressure down and it creates a pressure injury. And then all that coagulated blood is a perfect medium for bacteria. So, you know, we open that up and evacuate the clot and now there's a big significant deficit there and it takes forever to close. So, so please no sutures or staples on skin tears. But, you know, generally skin tears should heal in about two weeks with moist spoon healing. And we'll go to the next slide. So here's our final case study. <laughs> and I want you to just think about 
what you want to do with this wound, if it's healable, what you want to put on it, and how you're going to treat it. So this is a 92-year-old female. She banged her shin on the poster for the wheelchair leg rest this morning. She has CHF, hyperlipidemia, AFib, and RA. She has dementia. She's in a wheelchair all day, doesn't move around much, and she has a weekly bath. Meds include uh, torvastatin, coumadin, methyltrexate, and Tylenol. So what can we do? Well, first we have to determine a goal of care, and then we have to get a wound care plan in place. And just uh, think about this for a minute. What kind of skin tear would you say this is? Just think about in your head. Um, I'm going with a two or a three, Erin. Yeah, she's nodding her head too. <laughs> Depending on how much of that skin flap that can be repositioned, you know, it's a, it's a two or three for sure. Um, we also need to decide if it's healable. And I think, yeah, it, it appears that it would be. So we're gonna irrigate with a full 100 cc's of saline. And you know, those white squeezy bottles that we have in Island Health with the little nip top, they give you enough PSI to cleanse that wound bit. Probably some gentle pressure here. Um, she's on Coumadin, so we'll expect the bleeding to go on for a little bit longer. Uh, and then try to get that skin flap back into place. Although here it looks like mm, some of that flap is gonna need to be debrided away by, by someone who can do that debridement for you. Uh, there's edema in the peri wound area and we know the wound is on the lower leg. So you're probably gonna need the foam dressing here because we're gonna expect more drainage from this one than that tag absorb can, can manage. And if you've got tubi grip around, you could slide a piece of that over the top just to keep everything in place and provide a little bit of continued gentle pressure. And look to see if this resident has had a tetanus shot lately. <laughs> next one, next slide. Yeah, did we miss anything? We'll talk more when we're finished here. Next one. So to wrap up, uh, wound management principles. We need to know if the wound is healable. We need to know what stage of healing the wound is in, the etiology, how old the wound is. We need to monitor for infection and moisture balance, considering meds, comorbidities, resident compliance with the wound care plan. We also need to consider cost. Daily dressings use up a lot of nursing time and products. So the more expensive dressing that can stay on for a few days will actually save money in the long run, it saves nursing time and repeated product changes. And again, NSWOX can help you with product choice. We're really good at helping you figure out what will work best to get the wound closed with the least amount of pain for the resident, cost to the budget. And NSWOX understand what interventions are realistic within the nursing scope of practice here in Island Health. So, you know, we can help with that too. Next slide. The ideal dressing is the one that closes the wound the fastest. We've got lots of choice. Um, uh, you know, not often is the dressing wrong. There just might be something that's going to work a little better. Follow the product guidelines on the Click website and keep the phase of wound healing in mind. So as the wound closes, you'll need to change your wound care plan a little bit. Moist wound healing is best practice and is most of the long the long term care wounds are, are chronic or slow to heal. We need to also prevent and manage infection and biofilm. And the biofilm usually means serial ongoing wound debridement. Um, you know, and there's lots of different ways that we can do that. It doesn't need to be conservative sharp debridement. Erin mentioned wound cleansers, and these are our first line of defense. When we're talking about biofilm, normal saline does nothing. You need a product with a surfactant in it to disrupt that biofilm. So hypochlorous acid, uh, sodium hypochlorite will penetrate the biofilm and kill that bacteria from within. And they don't promote resistant strains. So we like those. Choose your topics carefully. Um, Inadine is Island Health Sprinkles Red Hot Sauce. We put that stuff on everything. And I know it's less expensive, but Iodine cytotoxic in long-term use, which means it actually prevents the wound from closing. And it's a pro-inflammatory. So if the wound is stalled in the inflammation stage, not necessarily the best choice. Silver is an anti-inflammatory antimicrobial and comes in lots of different um, 
combinations. There's non-adherent sheets, there's foam dressings, there's hydrofibers. We have PHMV, that's a great choice for bacteria and yeast and fungi and viruses, and that's pretty cheap too. Hydrofera Blue has gentian violet in it, so it's good for bacteria and yeast, but it doesn't donate to the wound bed. It's bacteriostatic, so it pulls things in, but doesn't donate down to the wound bed. Um, and this one was genotoxic in animal studies. So um, it also comes in uh, different formulations. So we have to decide which kind of hydrofera glue to use, and that'll depend on the exudate. So use this one with caution and get the NSWOX input. And just like inidine, hydrofera blue only gets changed when the color of the product changes. So you have to keep looking, you're gonna to have to keep monitoring this um, distressing, that's gonna take time too. Medi Honey works by changing the pH level in the wound bed, so bacteria can't survive. And I really like this one, but you do have to protect the peri wound from maceration because the honey melts with body heat and then it leaks out onto the peri wound skin and it can cause maceration. So, you know, all of these topicals should only be used for about two weeks. If you're not seeing results, it's usually not the antibacterial choice you've made. It's because there's something else happening in the wound. So changing the topical isn't going to make a difference. Get one of us to help you, um, you know, do another wound assessment, try to figure out what's going on. Refer to Erin. She's glad to set up a virtual visit if, if that's appropriate. Uh, let's next slide, please. I just thought I'd throw this one in. This is the quick information sheet for Inidine, just, just so you can see what they look like. Um, if you're gonna start building knowledge around products, pick one, pick one product to look at. Get to know where to use it and how to use it. Um, I'd suggest maybe start with the silver, like the Ergo Tool AG. Get to know the product well, so you know what wounds it is and isn't appropriate for. And then keep adding products and building as you go. Next slide. So this is not an exhaustive list, but these are kind of the staples that an NSWAP might recommend. And we have all of these available through stores. Next slide. So here are some resources and referrals that could be helpful. Um, you'll notice the Click website is in red. <laughs> and as I said, if you walk away with only one thing tonight, I hope it's this resource. The QR code is there. Um, you pop that onto your phone. The, the first QR code is for the Click website. And then the, the two codes beneath are for Wounds Canada Dressing Selection Guide and the Wounds Canada Dressing Formulary. For those uh, not in Island Health, this might be a good resource for you. And then of course we have Erin, our long-term care at NSWAP, uh, and her referral form is under construction. <laughs> You're gonna see a new version soon. Um, and then I've listed a few choices for any family practitioners who are here tonight, caring for our older clients and community, uh, community health services nurses that work in the, in the, uh, the clinics are great. They've got a lot of knowledge. Um, there's an outpatient clinic at RJH for stoma care and pressure injury. Does You do need a referral from a physician, uh, and that's for community clients only. The Urgent Vascular Limb Clinic is referral uh, from physician required, again, for community folks. And then the Burn and Wound Clinic, um, and you need plastics on board to get into that clinic. Next slide. And that's it. That's it. We're done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for your attention. We're going to take some time to answer questions now. Or if you have some resources of your own that you, you can share with us, please feel free to do so. Sure. Are we here? Can't hear you. <laughs> so you mute yourself there and ask Quay. We also have some questions in the Q&A box, so that might be a place to start too. Okay. Can you see those, Shelly? Uh, I can. There's a whole bunch of questions. Yeah, Aaron's going to pull up here beside me. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. We're going to start chatting. Okay. Look at all the people here all over the place. Fabulous. Fantastic. 
Um, you move forward a little bit, Aaron, then you'll we'll see you. You kind of come in and out of the background there. <laughs> uh, I'm just scrolling down the chat box here just to find the, the questions. If anybody's on that wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, jump in. Michelle, okay. interested. <laughs> I like the background, we're not downtown, I promise. <laughs> Our uh, Michelle, uh, are in long term care, interested to hear what to do with that scale that appears on diabetic legs. Yeah, that needs to be debrided away. Um, get Aaron to have a look at that, see if you can do a virtual visit, because depending on what that skin looks like, um, we've got choices to get rid of that scaling you're on the right track it needs to go we just need to figure out a really good way to do that and that totally depends on the wound assessment um you know what's happening with that client so uh refer to erin and she'll walk through that yeah yeah sorry i honestly don't have the answer to that tonight so yeah um you can either email me and i'll look it up for you <laughs> Dr. Brooke, the whole patient and not the whole patient. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Tim from the summit. Hi there. I'm just scrolling down here. Uh, Dr. Meyer is here. Dr. Brooke. Oh, there's one. Where? There's a Q&A right on the, the side there. So on the very far right bottom of your screen, if you click on that one, that's where the question should be. Yeah. Angela host Angelina, sorry, uh, is antiseptic cleanser uncomfortable on the wound bed? Depends on the cleanser. But those hypochloric um, cleansers, that hypochloric acid cleansers that you were talking about, the Anisept and the Vash, yeah. uh, both of those are not uncomfortable on the wound bed, particularly the, the Vash is my favorite. Um, it's non-irritant. And you can actually um, even use it as a peri wound cleanser. It's a uh, proofer and effective for that use as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's the bash, and not everybody has that one yet. If you're using vinegar or a bleach solution, yeah, yeah, those are uncomfortable for yeah. sure. And, and Dana's noted that too. Order the bash instead of yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you available for referrals to affiliates? Oh yeah, I answered Ken, and I said yes. <laughs> Yay, good. Uh, we heard about a normal saline shortage. Oh, I answered that one too. It was only for those little pink ones, so not for the um, 100 ml bottle that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what to do with the beige flaky oh, scale on the diabetic lower legs. Well, this is a common question. I better I better do my research on this one. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be my uh, homework for when I go home. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it really depends on what's going on with the leg. Um, there could be all kinds of stuff. It could be a buildup of skin and exudate. Um, there could be some eczema going on there as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it needs a bit more of an assessment to know what to do. Um, oh, I like this one. Malignant wounds, any role for palliative uh, radiation? Uh, yes, uh, um, you know, of course it depends on the uh, wound and the resident, but always refer to the radiation oncologist. And I will say, in my time in working in palliative care, uh, the radiation oncologist would say the exact same thing. Refer, and uh, <laughs> he's happy to have the business. So, yes. Uh, next question here, comment on oral doxy in the treatment of venous stasis. So um, I, I hope I was really clear, venous, um, that stasis dermatitis is an inflammatory response to the drainage. It's not an infection. Now, sometimes they do develop an infection if it's not treated. So you don't necessarily need a doxy. And if you've got doxy and it's working, it's probably because of the anti-inflammatory properties of the antibiotics and not necessarily the antibiotic itself. That's exactly the point I was making. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. That sounds like Dr. Brooks. It is, David Brooks. <laughs> so I, I see cases of dermato, uh, sorry, Dermatoscleral dermatitis, which is a, a variant of venous stasis, characterized by that those ugly dark red, uh, scaly, uh, and the and the way I distinguish it clinically as a as a not well trained physician is I look at the contour of the leg, and if the lower leg contour is perverted or disturbed, 
I think that's probably going to be dermatosclera. I can never say it, sclerodermatitis. And I've found, uh, whether it, I, it's not trial and error, it's someone taught me this once, that doxycycline, 100 milligrams PO once daily, you can use that for six or eight weeks. And it really, and you're using it the way you, you treat acne with an antibiotic, which is not for antibacterial, as you say, it's an anti-inflammatory effect. That's yeah. how doxy works, right? So I just wanted your comment if, if I'm on the right track. It seems to be working for me. The yeah. trick is in diagnosing it and distinguishing yeah. it from peripheral edema or you know, uh, um, uh, even, even mild venous stasis is the contour and how hard that leg is. Something you didn't talk about is just how, um, what's the word I want? You um, uh, starts with R. That woody fibrosis? Yeah, exactly. Very fibrotic. Thank you. And what, what I think is what I was taught was happening is that there's a chronic inflammation in there that is resulting in that fibrosis, right? Mm -hmm. And you can actually, I don't know what your experience is with Doxy, but I've seen it uh, improve appreciably. If, yes. And you're using it, as you say, for that anti-inflammatory property. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Brooks. That's, that's helpful. Um, and I'm just going to pop down to the next question about skin tears. Can you use Steri-Strip and Tegadormusor together? Um, I guess you could. I, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not sure why they would be used together. The Teg Absorb can stay on. So once you put it on, we want it to stay on for, you know, a week, as long as your drainage is okay. So the Steri Strips usually hold that skin flap in place. Um, but the Tegaderm Absorb will hold it in place too. So hopefully you only need one or the other. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it's wrong. It's just sort of like a little bit of overkill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. With the exception of skin tears should be moving towards a wash rather than saline. Hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. So when you say wash, I think about using um, some kind of a, a, a cloth or a, a gauze to rub against the wound and we definitely don't want to do that on a skin tear and, and maybe you're thinking that about the debris in the wound but if you use the saline bottles the little 100 cc um, bottles with the little nip, the nipple tip at the end you get enough pressure that does not hurt to clean that wound effectively oh, enough and he's wondering sorry uh jamie uh jamie's wondering if it's a you're talking about a, a bash wash. So with mm. the bash, yeah, uh, irrigate as you would um, use the normal saline. Yeah, and yeah. that will break up the biofilm. Yeah, and that's great, Jamie. That's, you know, bash is great for the biofilm. And, you know, we're all about the biofilm these days. There's been lots of research and study about biofilm and how that affects our chronic wounds. So excellent yeah. choice. And bash can be used. Uh, I know Shelly was talking about um, antimicrobial dressings in your two weeks there, and we don't want to overuse those, but bash can be used um, ongoing. So no stop date on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good washcloth. So, some people need to do that on their lower legs. <laughs> Does anybody want to unmute and ask any questions? And then we have a quick Q&A that we should check on that. Are you oh. guys? Are you available for regular support, Erin? Yes, I'm available <laughs> for regular support. So um, so I am new to this position. Sorry, there's my face, but anyways, just my, um, as NSWAC for long-term care. So I, like I said, I do work um, as the only NSWAC for 60 facilities, so I might not get back to you right away, but I am. You can email me if you just have like a question or if you want a more formal, like a patient-specific question then um, I just ask that you put in a referral just so I have a bigger picture. But if it's just like a product question or something, then yeah, mm -hmm. I'm available to look for this, yeah. Yay. Sherry, um, only tap water for chronic wounds. We don't have saline that provides pressure. If you have saline, you can always use, you know, if you've got a 35 cc syringe um, and uh, an irrigation tip, you can try that. We, we wanna get the PSI in there, right? So that it'll disrupt anything that's on the wound bed. So you can try that. Um, if you've got the Anicept or the VASH, you can put yeah. that on some gauze and leave it on your wound bed and that'll help to clean it. But it looks like she only 
I'm sure you're saying that they don't even have normal saline. Well, <laughs> well, the only thing we really have available is little tiny bottles and no dressing trays. So I think I'm going to get on this because I'm so uncomfortable doing this. Yeah, That's, mm -hmm. that should be standard um, stock for your facility. And, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank Thank you. You. yeah. Good call. Ask your management to support you in that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Joanna works privately. Doesn't have a lot of access. Stage four ulcer. <laughs> yeah, discharged from the hospital. Okay. So I wonder, I don't think anyone can referral. see these. So Joanna works in private assisted living and doesn't have a lot of resources and support in the community um, or access to wound care supplies. Just the knowledge and education from years of nursing. Very valuable. I had a stage four ulcer on a heel um, and a diabetic patient who's discharged from the hospital this way. I have done dressing changes two, three days, and now it is almost healed. Oh, but you don't have anyone to converse with. Oh, well, we're here. Well, email Erin. <laughs> Although, hi. Hi, 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 it's Joanna. <laughs> hi, Joanna. Hi, I am. Um, I was just, my last question is how do I converse with you? How do I email you? Because I don't have any of your information. Yeah, I know. That's the only thing is that um, I don't support private. So I only support own and operated or affiliate, um, but not private. What if we're licensed through Island Health? That's an affiliate then. Yeah, what's, do you mind sharing what? what um... I can't say, okay. I, can talk, I can talk to you about it, but not over yeah, this. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you can just email me and we'll talk about it. My email <laughs> on the um, slides. On the slides, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well done. If you have a diabetic with a stage four and it's almost healed, wow. Good he he was discharged from the, from the hospital December 17th mm -hmm. with a care plan. But when I took a look at the wound, it was not what I expected. And today, so th what, three months later to the day, it looks beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, I have no dressing supplies, so I'm like thinking in my head, "Well, what do I need?" <laughs> yeah. yeah, well done, you fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, um, Joanna also asked if she can make a referral, or does it need to be a physician? No, to access the NSWOC, anybody can do it. Anybody, physicians can do it, nurses can do it, um, carries can do it, OTs can do it. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll we'll see anybody from anybody. <laughs> find this information uh the information about um it's like how to make a referral how to communicate with you guys oh, I, okay I yeah i've left um i've left my email address and the link to my referral um on the slides but in the meantime you can just go on uh, no i can't go on the internet can you try it Pop back through. I have, I have access to the internet. I'm still an Island Health employee. I just. Um, Perfect. Okay. So on the internet, um, just uh, look up the skin uh, wound ostomy continence area of the internet. You can just type SWOC in the uh, search bar. And SWOC. Yeah. We can also share Aaron's information when we send out the CME credits and we will pop it up on our website as well. If you're um, comfortable with that, Aaron, we can oh, yeah, have it on our women's page. That sounds easier. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron is going to, she's doing some, uh, some construction <laughs> in the background for the referrals and, and, and stuff, but she's going to be doing virtual, uh, virtual visits with folks. So, you know, you can send your referrals through to her. She'll have a look and, Make yeah. plan. Yeah, I know not every facility is set up for virtual visits yet, but I'm hoping that um, you know people will start using the my virtual visit. Um, and if if not, if your facility is is uh, doesn't want to do this for whatever reason, then you know good old email and phone works too. But I do provide virtual visits through my virtual BC virtual visit. Sorry, BC virtual visit. Yeah. Just looking at a comment here from Roberto. Uh, you're at Hard House. Hi, thanks for joining us. 
sea cleanse. Um, I, if I'm, if I'm thinking about the same sea cleanse product, um, it's not going to work on biofilm unless there's a surfactant in it, or there's, um, you know, it's it's an acid base. So you're going to have to look on the side. I'm not as familiar with that product, um, but have a look. If there is a surfactant, that will help. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, oh, Kate. Hi, Kate. Thank you for joining. Kate has just posted, if everybody can see it, the uh, link to the website for Erin. Thank you, Kate. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Any other any other questions or does anybody have any really good uh, products or information to share with us? Um, Dr. Brooke offered up his his thoughts about the doxy, which is great. Yeah, we don't have all of the answers for everything. So if you've got something that you think works really well, let's share it with the group. <laughs> it's what we're here for. That's um, left open the air. Um, I wouldn't Depends. say, <laughs> I would say if you're leaving something open to air, um, we're usually talking about that dry, um, hard black eschar that is on um, non healable arterial wounds. Then we can leave it open to air and paint with uh, povidine iodine. Um, but most other wounds, uh, leaving it open to air will cause more pain dries out yeah. yeah 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 it'll need to be debrided if it's not uh an arterial wound on a lower limb you know at a, at a distal spot yeah make a wound referral we need a little bit more information there and also you know just because i was talking about palliative wounds so even if we're not wanting to heal a wound it's just more comfortable to have a, a moist um a wound bed coverage than, than leaving it open Great, lots of really good questions. Okay. Um, question on the chat, would you be able to send out an updated long-term care formulary list? <laughs> um, if, you, if, you have if you have access to the intranet, if you, uh, if you go into stores for RJH, our entire formulary list is there. It's pages long, but everything that we have um, not just wound care, everything is there. So you'll have to kind of scroll through to find stuff. If you're looking for something in particular, uh, give give Erin a call, email her and ask if we have it uh, around or if you're wondering if it's, if it's formulary. Uh, products directed by wound clinician and products recommended for funding. Yeah, so I wonder, Duane, if you're talking about, you know, what products you should have on hand. And that's kind of a tough one because, yeah, you don't want these products to expire. They're expensive products. So you want to have your basics on hand. Um, but, yeah, email me if, if there's a product that you think that you're, like, using all the time and you wonder, like, should we have this on regular stock and we can maybe advise. Yeah. yeah. I... If you had to make a choice, um, I might have the Ergo Tool AG around. It doesn't expire quickly. It's in a sealed foil um, package. It's silver. It's nonstick. It can stay on for a few days until you know you can chat with Aaron and figure out what to do. Uh, very few people will react to silver, even if they have a silver allergy to to the metal of the silver. The ionized silver in dressings is different. So mm -hmm. most of the time that's fine. I, I actually have that around all the time at my place. Yeah, and I wonder too if, if building, um, and, and everyone's facility is different size, but building a wound, um, wound care product shelf, let's say, um, if you focus not on, on um, product names, but instead on like the different categories of products, like, you know, we'll have this type of foam, We'll have this type of um, silver dressing. We'll have, you know, that this type of hydrocolloid. I'm missing a lot of categories here, but rather than thinking, um, because there's so many products out there, and there's no need to purchase them all and have them all on hand. It's really just having the right categories. You know, like what what's our super absorbent dressing that we have on that? Oh, we have classic pads because they're cheap. That kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Good. I think we've answered all of the questions that came up. 
Um, so I guess we're we're mindful of the time. <laughs> it's Guinness time. Oh, yeah. Happy yeah. Happy St. Patty's Day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any other questions, you can always get a hold of Erin through her email or uh, the referral form. She's there. I sort of help out in the background if if Erin's super busy or she's away. I might pick up a referral here or there, but um, she's. You know, she's watching those emails constantly, and you can look for. <laughs> yeah. know, constantly. You can look for an update for the referral form coming soon. And I think Erin's also working on some education. Yes. Coming, so yeah. you can look forward to that. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I'll just and maybe put a little yeah plug in um, before we go. Um, I'm building a, a community of practice, um, and if anyone's interested in joining a community of practice. Um, email me or if you just want to know what it's about um I'm, I'm just taking a list of people that are interested it's like if you email me it's not like oh you're in um like i will send you a formal invite and you can accept or decline i will hold you to anything but um but yeah just email me if you're interested and then what i want to do is sort of like um that'll be a, a resource for education and sharing actually um who's that who had no one to talk to Enjoying our community of practice, and then we can talk about it. Um, is that Joanna? Yeah. Um, so, and then I will be uh, uh, delivering some education, and yeah, it will be virtual education, of course, because uh, we're a big island, but keep your eye out for that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for being here. Great questions. Um, can tell you're, you're thinking about your wound care, and, and you know, we're always happy to talk about wounds. So. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Hey, okay, thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming, Shelly. And yeah, thank you so much for, for coming again and speaking to us. We really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye for now.